Kyle versus Drew. No, this isn't a debate about which Taylor Swift breakup song is better. This is a discussion, discussion about the new starting quarterbacks at two big brand football schools, and if one of them can move their legend forward this Saturday as the Buckeyes take on the Nittany Lions in a marquee matchup of college football's Week 8. Now, Drew Aller for Penn State has been the wonder boy behind Sean Clifford, who played for what seems like 13 years in Happy Valley. And the questions about him being able to take Penn State to the next level in the Big Ten East will only be answered if James Franklin lets him take some shots to try and open up what has been a pretty vanilla passing game this weekend. How vanilla? Well, Penn State has, without a doubt, one of the most conservative passing offenses in the country, but for a couple great reasons. Number one, they're pretty daggum good at running the football. They're hovering around the top 35 nationally in rushing yards per game, and they really haven't had to open up the passing game with the way their games have gone. Now, Keandre Lambert-Smith is their only receiver to have over 100 receiving yards in a game so far, and it's been a mix of him plus tight ends Theo Johnson and Tyler Warren who've taken the brunt of the passing game. Now, Penn State's going to need some auxiliary help this weekend if they're going to be able to move the ball, Against an Ohio State defense is pretty daggum good itself. That's paging Mr. Cephas as well on the outside. It's about time you show up. The second reason is Penn State legitimately might have the best defense in the country right now. They rank number two in the nation against the run and number one against the pass. And I know their schedule hasn't been the toughest, but if, when you look at the numbers and you watch these guys run around, they can really play. So why would you get crazy with a new starting quarterback when you have a defense that is absolutely shutting the city down. Now, having said all that, Ohio State has a plethora of playmakers on the outside that we know will push Penn State harder than any opponent they've faced so far this season. It's really not even close. This isn't Iowa scampering out here on the outside. Now, Penn State likely won't be able to be as conservative as, conservative as they have been on offense and be able to score enough to beat Ohio State this weekend. So you have to take some risks down the field if you want to win this game. Now, Kyle McCord on the other side hasn't been electric, but he has been feeling his way out too. He's more battle-tested than Drew Aller is in big games. And a jump ball to guys like Marvin Harrison Jr., Egbuka, who should be back this week, and the rest of the Avengers they have running around on the outside is actually a good decision. So the question becomes for Ohio State, can you run the ball well enough against this stout Penn State defense to be able to loosen them up in the secondary to take some shots and get some man on man. Now that's the biggest question. Either way, this game's gonna be awfully physical and one of these quarterbacks is about to take a huge step forward in their legacy and take one giant leap toward making an appearance in the Big Ten title game if they can get past Michigan. If they can get past Michigan. If, but allegedly. to James Franklin, just remember, scared money don't make no money, man. It David does. Cohn knows a, little, knows a thing or two about being uh, in the Big Ten East. As a quarterback, former Michigan QB, my brother uh, played in the highest mountain in all the land, right next to where the Grinch lives at Western uh, State, Colorado. Crappy wide, plays wide receiver, yeah, his heart grew three times, and when he saw you make that play, when you look at, at, at this game, it's two really good teams. Yes, somebody is going to have to break through offensively to you know you need to score some points to win this game. I, I think it's going to be a showing match a little bit early, but I understand why Penn State has kind of kept kept Drew Aller, they haven't asked him to do too much. Not that they haven't made some plays down the field, but if they're going to win this game, David, it, it can't just be a one-trick pony. Mm -hmm. You have got to be able to, if anything, prove to Ohio State that you're willing to throw the deep ball to try and open up you know, the run game that we know for Penn State that's been pretty good. I mean, you look at the numbers, you know, uh, they're literally throwing the ball. They rank 103rd in the country. They're throwing the ball 44% of the time. Mm -hmm. Haven't had to, really. You look at completion percentage. They're 60th in the country. Yards per pass, 87th in the country. Passing yards per game, 72nd in the country. So, I mean, at some point, you got to let the dog eat in this game. Yeah, Penn State's going to need a complete arsenal to win this football game. I'm really glad you talked about the uh, rush yards allowed on their, their rush defense, averaging 72.5 yards given up, while at the same time, Penn State is averaging over 200 yards yeah. on the ground themselves. Here's my biggest question for this game. How much of those stats, which are, which are very impressive, have to do with the schedule that they have played? Penn State is far more untested right now than the Buckeyes are. I think on OSU's side, something like six of the seven weeks they've 
played have been against undefeated teams. Yeah. And obviously we saw down the stretch a big win over Notre Dame, which that was a marquee game. That gave Kyle McCord a chance to say, hey, not only can I win a football game like this, I can lead the game winning drive. So that's my biggest question for Penn State right now. Um, will they be able to run the ball? Because like you said, if they can, then that'll open things up. Makes it easier. For, for, for Drew Aller. Um, uh, you know, another thing is for, for Penn State, you know, obviously they're going on the road. Can they deal with just the level of athleticism that OSU is going to have? Which really brings in something that we haven't talked about for a lot of games so far this, this season, but halfway through a college football season, injuries. The Buckeyes are banged up. Will that play a part in this? Now, Ryan Day said yesterday he's hopeful that he will get starters back for this game, which include Emike uh, uh, Mboka. All right, Tra- uh, Travion Henderson and Denzel Burke at corner. All three of those guys didn't play last week, I believe. Uh, Mike Mboka, I believe, was hurt in the um, against Maryland a couple. He didn't weeks even ago. travel last week. He didn't travel against uh, who was it? Uh, Purdue. Purdue. Uh, he didn't travel. So Ryan Day says he's hopeful to get those guys back. What when you hear that? What do you think as a coach? Is that just um? I you know again you you. <laughs> You don't really want to come out. You always want to give at least the illusion that they could play so For you sure. take preparation time you yep. know, from the other team. Uh, I, I think the word hopeful, I, I think Ryan Day's being genuine about this. Okay. I, I think there's a reason. You know, I think it was a lower body injury, whatever you want to call it, uh, with Abuka last weekend where he didn't even travel. They want to make sure to get him right against Perdon't uh, in that <laughs> absolutely ass beating of a lifetime. But you brought up their schedule. Penn State's played West Virginia, who's come on lately. Yes. Yeah. Right, who's come on lately. Delaware, meh. Illinois, meh. Iowa, yeah, they're ranked. That's the but, one to me, though. You know, offensively, it's you know, it's 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 a slow and steady pace. Let's just put it that way. Northwestern and UMass. None of those offenses scare you at all. Or it's not even close to the Lambos and no. and Bugattis and Ferraris that are running out on that field no, this Saturday. But I was defense though to beat Iowa 31 to nothing does at least at least keeps me from saying agree. Um Penn State's not fraudulent. I, I think No, no, no. I, that is not. You know? Yeah. Penn I am not saying Penn State is fraudulent. I think right now they're getting a lot of the benefit of the doubt. Sure. When you look around nationally, a lot of people are pick, picking Penn State. And look, who the hell knows at the end of the day, it's a college football game with, with two with two really good teams. But Blaine, th- there's a couple things that I'm looking at here as well. What do you do if your Penn State and Ohio State hits a couple of those big plays early and you get down and you can't afford to be methodical and go about it, hey, you know, we're just going to run into the wall, play action when we need to, throw the quick game when we need to. And it's not that Drew Aller can't make these plays. Drew Aller is way more talented, in my opinion, than Sean Clifford. But we know that talent doesn't just get you there alone. It's, it's got to be a blend. There's got to be some balance there. When you look at the, when you look at this game, if Ohio State hits a couple plays, whether it be to Marvin Harrison Jr., they're gonna, uh, and and they, they typically are, right? Maybe score a touchdown on special teams, something like that. Is Penn State good enough to be able to come back on the road uh, with their offense? Well, it, dep- it depends on how much you're down and how how early is it. I mean, if it, you're down 10, 14 in the first half, I don't think you panic. I think you need to stick to your identity. Like the good thing about it, if you're Penn State, you can always lean on that defense. Like, even if you're not proven, I mean, one, you got Chop Robinson and these fellows up front almost leading the nation in sacks. And if you look at Ohio State, I mean, they've gave, they're kind of middle of the pack in the, in the Big Ten. They're giving up uh, 10 sacks on the year. Mm-hmm. Cal, they have Some teams have gotten to Kyle McCord. And we go through all these big names in this game. You got Marvin Harrison Jr., who's the best receiver in football. That's not a doubt. If, uh, if Abuka plays, he's obviously going to be a first-round pick. Stover's nice. But guys, like, that's going to be the difference to me. Guys like Kyle Stover. Like, the— the tight end is such a, a versatile position when you play a team like Penn State. Because look, man, Penn State's DBs aren't a joke, all right? Penn State up front, the front seven, they're on a joke. They're going to be a good football team. But how you beat these guys is a guy who can block, right, when Kyle Sover, who can also win against Cade safety, Cade Cade Sover, Sover, who win against safeties, right, who can, and who can win against linebackers in one-on-one routes. Because you're only going to stop Marvin Harrison so much, and if it's me, if Nabuka's banged up, I'm doubling Marvin as much as I can in this game. Mm-hmm. But I don't think this Penn State offense is that good. I really don't. And if you watch Penn State, you haven't been impressed with this offense. Drew Aller is still coming along, but I still think there are some mistakes in here that he's going to make in this game. I'm leaning Ohio State in this game. Ohio State's defense have kept them in it the entire year, but their offense is starting to come along. Trayvon Henderson comes back. That's the one thing that scares me in this game. If you are Ohio State, you haven't been able to run the ball the entire year, and you go, by, look, go back and look at past games, Ohio State's, been, and Ohio State's and the Michigan 
have been able to run the ball against Penn State. So if they can't run the ball against Penn State, then you get kind of nervous. You got to block, uh, block Chop Robinson and Isaiah up front. But I still think Ohio State is just too athletic and too good on the outside in the skill positions to really be held down for four quarters. Something else that doesn't take a ton of effort. Right? If you like drinking wine, right? I'm going to be honest. Before I met my wife, I really didn't drink wine. I drink it every now and then now. I, I enjoy it. You know, not a connoisseur by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but that's what she drinks. It's really, you know, that and, and bourbon whiskey. That's all we have in our house. Uh, so, but who doesn't love a glass of wine, right? But how do you figure out what type of wine you love when there are so many to choose from? Like I said, I didn't, I didn't know, all right? But our friends over at First Leaf, they help you out, all right? When we became members, we signed up for the subscription service and it delivers wine right to our door. And when you sign up with First Leaf, they run you through a quiz to figure out what kind of wine you like. They ask if you prefer sweet taste or bitter taste, reds, whites, all that stuff. Then they'll match award-winning bottles to your taste, and you'll only get the flavors you'll love in every shipment. Guys, I'm telling you right now, if your wife drinks wine or vice versa, if your wife and your husband, you drink wine, this is a great Christmas gift. Oh, yeah. You want to know why? Because it's a gift that keeps on giving. You get it once. You, you get it monthly. Um, it's a fantastic product. We've already gotten two shipments to our house. You want to talk about a happy woman? When that box of wine shows up to the house, like now I understand how people back in the day used to feel like when milk showed up at the door. You're like, man, the milk's here, man. I'm a, I'm a milk milkman man. just came by. The milkman came by. Uh, now, now they're dropping wine off? Man, wow. 2023 is wild. All right, so give your palate what it really wants with First Leaf. Go to tryfirstleaf.com. That's tryfirstleaf.com slash booster to sign up, and you'll get your first six hand curated bottles for just $44.95. That's right. Try go to t r y f i r s t l e a f dot com slash booster. Try firstleaf dot com slash booster. Helps out the show. Helps out you. Great Christmas gift. Sneaky, good Christmas gift. You'll surprise her and she'll love it. Yeah, but we talk about the game comes down to a handful of plays. Those three mm -hmm. to five plays. You're obviously going to lean, especially at home, to Marvin Harrison Jr., to Stover, to Abuka, to to those guys. I just, I'm so fascinated to watch what Penn State does on early downs in this game offensively. Yeah. Because if you're going to make hay, I think, against Ohio State, because you know what Ohio State's thinking about Penn State coming in this game. It's on the road. I think Penn State thinks for them to win this game, it needs to be low scoring. It needs to be kind of like Notre Dame, Ohio State a little bit. I don't think this is a game where Penn State's sitting here saying, man, you know, if it turns into a track meet, we feel really good about, about where we're at. I just don't think they're built like that. Uh, but, you know, you talk about the auxiliary players. We talk about Marvin Harrison Jr. having over 600 receiving yards. Cade Stover having almost 360. Egbuka having over 300. Uh, then you look at Fleming and Tate, two guys that, that you know, have, have been able to help out in the passing game as well. Then you look at Penn State and, you know, Lambert Smith's the only guy, like I said, that's gone over 100 yards in the game. I thought Cephas was going to have a much bigger impact coming over. It's literally been two tight ends and Keandre Lambert Smith. You know, another thing to consider here is the Buckeyes haven't played a complete game yet, and they've started slow for a, a large majority of these games. I think your instinct is right, though. If they were to go up double digits, they get up 10 or something. To me, it's lights out for Penn State. I don't see them coming back. But at the same time, I said the same thing when they played Notre Dame, and they got up 10. Notre Dame actually fought back, stayed committed to the run game, took the lead, and the Buckeyes had to complete that game-winning drive. The one I keep going back and forth on is the over-under. Right now, the line is 46 and a half. Yeah. Initially, it struck me as low. Uh, I think the Buckeyes are going to score, and I think you know Penn State has the ability to score. But then again, this could be a 21-13 game. Like, yeah. you really well, I would say that. I think Ohio State played a complete game against Purdue. I mean, mm -hmm. from start to finish, uh, that's the best I've seen them look the entire year. Other than that, you go back to, you go back to that Maryland game. And you got to remember who Maryland is as a football team. They have almost three NFL receivers. I mean, too, little two will obviously make mistakes, but he's a good quarterback. And their defense isn't terrible either. So I think Ohio State finally put it together, and that's on the road yeah. against Purdue. And I, I think you'll you'll see that against Penn State as well. Yeah, I, I right now the the spread's three and a half. Ohio State it, it was at four yesterday. It came down like you said that under. It's gone from forty seven out of forty six and a half. Uh, it's really hard for me not to want to lock in minus two and a half for Ohio State. Mm -hmm. Now that's down to three and a half because I don't know if it's going to go down any further. I'm going to let it marinate a little bit. I locked in USC minus six and a half against Utah. That number shot up to seven uh, the last time I saw it. I don't know if it's changed, but we want to know what you think. Who's going to win, Ohio State or Penn State? Let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. Ah, YouTube.
we meet once again. Thanks for coming by. If you haven't already subscribed, what are you doing? It's unbelievably easy. You know what else is easy? Hitting that like button on videos. That really helps. It's kind of like a cheat code to get it in the algorithm. Also, make sure you leave a comment, turn that notification bell on, and you'll know every time that we drop content.